even begin <laughs> to explain to fill in to TSA security guards? Like, where does that conversation even start? How do you explain eight foot long leather straps <laughs> to people who believe in moral values? I love that bit. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Conversations Over Coffee with me, Rabbi Steve Wernick. Today, I am delighted to welcome my friend, Joel Chasnoff, to the conversation. I look forward to asking him about that opener, about how you explain to fill in to TSA security, but even more importantly, to have a conversation about the healing power of comedy. Uh, before we get to that, uh, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and BethTV. If you like today's conversation, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Comments are always appreciated and help us get the conversation to more people. If you have questions for our guests, please put them in the Facebook or YouTube chat, and we'll do our best to bring them into the show. And with that, with that out of the way, uh, let me introduce my friend, uh, Joel Chasnoff. Uh, Joel is a stand-up comedian, TV, and podcast host, and author of three books, including the best-selling memoir, The 188th Crybaby Brigade. He has a new book coming out in May. Uh, that book is Essential Tennis, um, not connected to Judaism at all, as he would say. Uh, since 2001, Joel has performed his unique brand of clean, cutting-edge comedy in more than 1,000 events in 10 countries. Uh, please join me in welcoming Joel Chasnoff. Hi, Reb Steve, and hello to our audience. Hi, Good Joel. I always, you know, it's uh, whenever I do an introduction or I hear my even my own introduction, I always think like, you know, God, his mother must be proud. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's always so weird hearing oneself introduced in the third person with a bio that we wrote and everybody <laughs> knows we wrote it. But, and, and then you feel so haughty and unhumble hearing these accolades, but you have to do it. So you have to do you it. For reading and it. as I said, whenever I write my own bio, I always think about like, you know, what would make my mother proud? <laughs> and that's how I do it. So I, look, let, let's just kick off. We, we sure. shared a just a little bit of a clip from uh, one of your comedy routines. How do you explain to fill into TSA security guards? It's difficult. I've had to do it. The joke, like a lot of my jokes, actually came from a real experience where <laughs> I was taken out of my, uh, you know, post 9-11 when everyone was getting searched and there was a lot of security. It came out of my carry-on bag. And I think I said, well, it's leather straps that Jews put on in the morning. But the more I described it, the more you sort of re realized how ridiculous it actually sounded. Um, and, and then, of course, the real art is then to take sort of that uh, the, that mess of observation and craft it into a joke that would actually make sense on stage with the fewest amount of words possible and the biggest punchline you can get. But, uh, it, you know, I really do believe that the best comedy comes out of real life experiences. And as a Jew in America, so much of my childhood was that trying to explain being Jewish to people who. Who are not and my mom converted to judaism so i have a whole half a side of the family who was you know who is not jewish and so we always were explaining did, where did you grow up i grew up in uh, evanston illinois just outside of chicago um so evanston at, at that time though wasn't wasn't really a big jewish community I mean, and we it's were... still not you know skokie which is right next door a lot of holocaust survivors were settled in in skokie uh, the joke is, uh, it's the flower capital of the world. There's a rose in bloom on every corner. <laughs> but, <I'm proud. laughs> uh, but, uh, but Evanston is actually pretty Gentile, if I may use that word. It's where prohibition started. And, you know, I, I still had to sell Passover candy uh, to my neighbors who were not <laughs> Jewish in Evanston. And I wrote another bit about that, of just trying to explain why why there would be a candy called almond bark and why it would be $38 for two pieces. You know, people who aren't Jewish aren't really used to that. People who are Jewish think that's a bargain. And then some. <laughs> and, then, and then some. <laughs> uh, how long have you been doing comedy now? Well, officially, uh, you know, I keep track of comedy. When did I have to, when, when could I stop doing another job? And I was a math tutor uh, on the side for my first few years of doing comedy. And I officially stopped tutoring math 
in uh, 2001. So it's it's now, you know, this is the 21st year, I guess, that I've been able to do comedy as, as a full-time job. When you think back, I mean, that that's 2001. That's 21 years at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it, it's almost a generation. Uh, when you think back over your career, what are some of the things that you've learned? Wow. I, I mean, I guess just on a career level that there's very little you can actually control except for your own effort, making the jokes and trying to uh, try, trying to be a good comedian and trying to be a good artist. I've definitely tried many things to manipulate the system, going to the right clubs, the right open mics, making the right videos to send to the right people. But most most of what happened has been would seem serendipitous, you know, meeting the right person at the right time. I also believe it's not necessarily just luck that when, you know, when you've been at it a while, you'll naturally meet the right people. But the more I ever tried to control things, uh, the the less it seemed to work. And the more I let go, the, the better things uh, would happen. Um, you know, even like just an example of how I met you. There was no, you know, it was never engineered. But I think uh, it was when you were at USCJ and then you were took a pulpit at a shul where I performed. We reconnected again. And I think most of the other way around. Like that. Was it the other way around? It was the other way around. We met um, in uh, Jersey. We met in Jersey when I was in Jersey okay. in my first show. Um, and uh, that's when we met. Uh, but we became we became closer, I think, at the, at the USCJ level right. when I was there in the last decade. Yeah, yeah no, but, but again, I, you I, can't plan it. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, and the older you get, the more you realize that that's Certainly. true for all of life. Um, that, you know, wherever we thought we had control, we, we really have much less than we think we have. Um, and that brings us to really what I'm most interested in our conversation uh, sure. today uh, with the pandemic is like a case in point. Um, suddenly the entire world is impacted by this little tiny, you know, molecular virus uh, that, that shuts down the world then unfortunately gets a lot of people sick and many, many, many people died as a result of it. Talk about not having control. Um, one of the industries that were really impacted hard um, were the entertainment and the arts. Um, how, did you, how did you find your way during COVID? Well, the first stage was very scary. I had one show cancel and I thought, well, they're just nervous. And then an entire spring tour was canceled. And, you know, for a comedian, you know, that's that's income, too. And I have four kids and a wife. And so it was uh, it had a, a, a real impact. And uh, there was definitely panic. Um, but soon after, I, here's another, like, I guess, serendipitous thing. I got an email from a guitarist who was doing an online like a Zoom concert. And so I thought, whoa, maybe comedy could be Zoom also. So I tried to retool some stuff and sent out an email to everyone I knew saying I'm available for Zoom comedy. And in the first month, I did a lot of Zoom, probably 100 Zoom comedy shows um, that, you know, in the two years now. And the first ones were terrible because it's <laughs> you just I was starting all over again in a completely different art form. It's not just doing jokes you know, on a screen, it's uh, all of that audience interaction was gone, the relationship, the ability to read a crowd. Um, so it had to be a, a different performance uh, altogether. And I've done some live shows since then. And now those feel a little bit strange, actually having, you know, an audience out there and, and paying attention and not shutting off their screens. It's a good thing, but it's, uh, it's different now in, in the other way. I mean, as, I'm finding that too in the synagogue. I'm sure. Well. Like, you know, for the last two years, I've trained myself to look at a camera because nobody's been in the congregation. But now that people are coming back into the congregation, I notice I'm still looking at the camera. And you have to force yourself to, to look at it. But people. is the camera still on? Are you are you guys recording anyway for people who are at home? Well, it, it, we're we're not recording, so to speak. We, we're streaming. We are, we're live streaming. Um, especially right. on Shabbat and holidays. Um, one of the things that we've learned from COVID is that there are all sorts of people for whom synagogue was previously inaccessible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by by live streaming, uh, we make it accessible for them. Um, we, we believe that those for whom that are able to come back into the space will do so when they feel ready. I mean, today is the first day in Ontario that the mask mandate is being lifted in two years. 
Um, and Two so years, I, incredible. Yeah, right. So I don't, I don't expect that you know this Shabbat suddenly there'll be three hundred people in shul again. Um, I think it's going to take some time for people to watch what what happens again. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I believe that people will come back. But what we've learned is that there's people that were never able to come in the first place. Um, you know, especially older people, people with that that had uh, either emotional or physical um, ailments um, that were that were otherwise um, not able to come in. And what we we just countless stories of people that are engaging that otherwise wouldn't have been able to do that. So we're our intention is to continue to to do that and to right. um, to to grow uh, the number of people that. Um, will benefit from the Bethsaidic experience. I think it's a great move. You know, my mom has MS and she's been bedridden for a while. And it's, you know, going to synagogue was a few times a year decision and it took a lot of effort. And uh, now, now it's obviously much easier. And it sort of seems like a no brainer. Like, hey, we had this technology for a while. How did we not think about it before? But um, it, it took the pandemic, I guess, for us to, to see it differently. Well, I mean, that's that's usually what happens, right? It takes some sort of trauma to to um, to shine a spotlight on trends that are already happening, right? And 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 they force you to think about the world in different ways um, because it's that kind of disruption. Um, I'm curious, what do you count as a minion for like a shacharit service on a weekday? If a zoo, is a Zoom camera on with the face being seen count as a so a, a Zoom camera on and micro even more important than the Zoom camera is the microphone unmuted, <laughs> being able to hear someone say "Amen" to a blessing. If the microphone is unmuted, yes, <laughs> like I can see the whole Talmudic, Talmudic discussion. That's the Talmudic, uh, <laughs> that's the Talmudic uh, thing. Um, y- yeah, we've been during the period of Shat Hatachak, the the emergency circumstance, which I think we're still in. I don't think we're out of it yet. Um, we've been uh, on weekdays. We've been counting a minion, ten people in person or online, uh, with microphones unmuted, and really encouraging people to sh- share the videos because that's right. the part that people are missing, which is the the human interaction. Mm-hmm. And I would say that probably eighty percent of our participants share share their video. Um, but that's what we've been counting. Uh, and when we don't have a minion. Uh, we still do mourners Kaddish because of a special resonance of Kaddish. Right. Um, we made the decision for Shabbat and Chagim, Shabbat and festivals, to live stream rather than use Zoom because there's less uh, manipulation of the technology on right. Shabbat, um, both for the user as well as for the producer. We have a, a non-Jewish staff member who's um, who, who we hired to be our digital communications and production manager uh and um, aka shabbos goy but that's okay <laughs> um right yes it, but, <laughs> but in the same way in the same way that you have maintenance staff right right, in, right. in the show um this is just a little bit more sophisticated um but um uh but we have we have that expertise now and you theoretically if you turn off your your sleep function on your computer uh, and you have your computer set already to the page that's ah. TV, TV, um, the live stream will come on automatically. Um, so, we, you know, the, the Toronto in general, Betsetic in particular, is a more traditionally minded conservative synagogue. Right. Um, and so that's what made sense for, for our community. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, especially now as, as we're seemingly coming out of the pandemic, um, are you finding um, comedy as, as, and even during the pandemic, I mean, to what to what extent do you did you find that people found comedy to be be healing, to be adding towards resilience, um, and to help people uh, just manage and cope with this crisis? Well, definitely. I, I think uh, after a typical live comedy show, before the compliments would be, this was really funny. I could really, you know, it was it was great to laugh. It was a good time. But people after a Zoom shows, uh, the comments would actually say, thank you. We needed this. There's a There was definitely an element of relief, of healing. Part of it was laughter itself. Part of it was seeing other people in the community also enjoying a positive experience at the same time. And part of it was just being able to forget everything. I, I One comment you never would have expected to hear is it was so good to be away from the news. I think 
I think we're forgetting it wasn't just the pandemic, but how much negativity was in the news and how frightening the stories were and uh, leaders seeming to turn their back on their people. And I think people enjoy taking a break from from that as well. Just the hafsaka, you know, the, the recess from from the antagonism. Uh, and, and so comedy was able to to do that. And also now that we're coming out of it, uh, I think people are are turning to comedians because they said, you know what, usually for our Federation event, we have a speaker on Iran or anti-Semitism. But this year, we, we really want to try something different. We want to give some uh, a treat to our uh, to our communities. And so comedy comedy is getting a spotlight. Um, did did you create bits specifically designed for that reaction? You mean about politics, about COVID, no, about, or about, about resiliency, about mm. uh, about lifting people's spirits? I mean, was that was that something big in, in intention, or was was it just you were bringing the comedy, and it happened to have that that impact? Yeah, I don't. There, I myself did not write bits about uh, resilience, but I often in Zoom shows will share a few jokes um, about that idea. And one of them I tell is from Moshe Waldox. He's the the co-author of the Big Book of Jewish Humor, and he's a friend of mine. And one of his favorite jokes is about the minister, the priest, and the rabbi, and they're talking about what they want people to say about them at their funeral. And the priest says, at my funeral, I want people to say that I was a kind and generous human being. And the minister says, at my funeral, I want people to say that I was always there to listen. And the rabbi says, at my funeral, I want people to say, look, he's moving. The idea being that, you know, we Jews have the chutzpah to believe that even in the worst of situations, there's still there's still hope that the story isn't quite yet over. And I think that joke has new meaning in an era like this, because uh, so much of the era we're living, we've been living through is about not giving up, about believing, even when it seemed hopeless, that there would be uh, that there there was a light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we have these vaccines now. But I remember two years ago when it first happened and there was no vaccine. It was it was panic. We had no idea what was going to happen. I'm sure you saw with Judaism as well. A lot of the tefillot, the prayers took on a new connotation um, suddenly that uh, maybe we'd been ignoring or overlooking for a long time. Yeah, it's also, you know, what, what, we, what we talked about here, and I'm sure others did as well, is that when, you're, when you have a 4,000 year old tradition, mm -hmm. we have language for this. Um, you know, with, this is not the first pandemic our people have ever experienced. The, the Talmud, for example, says that when the plague's at your door, stay home. You know, so the notion- What is that? That's in the Talmud? It's in the Talmud, right? You know, so fifth century Babylonia, when the plague's at your door, stay home, right? So, you know, they they understood that at moments of, of pandemics or at least a plague coming through town, right. uh, the thing to do to stop the spread is to stop interactions. Um, so, you, so you stay home. Uh, we Even the language shat hatachak of emergency circumstances, um, the notion of uh, nefesh do halacha, that when when a person's life is at stake or when the needs of the community um, are are such that you can push aside the the other halachot, the other um, Jewish law practices, including Shabbat, in order mm -hmm. to to preserve a life. I mean, this is all our language. You asked, for example, about uh, about Zoom and counting in the minion. Uh, there's a, a rabbi from Germany, I think it was 1587, he's one of the glasses on the Shulchan Aruch, uh, that, um, who wrote that when the plague came, if people lived in a, in a, I guess, an apartment building or a dwelling where they had a shared courtyard, and you could lift up the windows and stick your head outside such that you could see people's faces and hear them, that you could constitute a minion with people sticking their heads out the window. Um, I, that's I, your Zoom, right? That was the Zoom exactly of the 1500s. Right. So. It wasn't. It wasn't so hard for me right. to look at that and say, "How if he had this technology, how would he not say that this is okay?" Right. Um, you know, uh, and you know, one could say, you know, all these other things about the spirit of Shabbat and so forth and so on. But at, at a certain point, if we didn't use this, we would have lost people. Um, and for those, uh, not only if, if the entire community didn't use this, you would have lost them, you know, the gamre, just period. People would have just. But they would have lost something, too. They might they have lost, lost hope and, and their health. And so it's it goes both ways. We, we have um, 
you know, the, the a past president and the current chair of the board started um, because the Kiddush Club was going to be gone on Shabbat during the Haftarah reading, right? The Kiddush Club was going to be gone. So they started, uh, we just, just last Friday, it was a two-year anniversary. Um, at uh, an hour before Shabbat, they hosted a Zoom call and they asked um, a couple people each week to just share what they were experiencing and what they were feeling. And, you know, anywhere from 50 to 75 people would show up for these things. And every single week for two years, maybe I think there was three times that we didn't do it. Wow. Um, people would share and it'd be some of the most profound elements of, of sharing and of community building that you could possibly imagine. And, and all because this technology was available to us. It would have been very different without the technology. I think people would have been much more isolated uh, and, and alone yeah. without this than they otherwise would have been. Absolutely. But, um, um, but I know that, that comedy, um, you know, comedy helps because people do need to, to lighten the load every once in a while. I mean, there was like a heaviness that um, seemed to be pervasive over the last couple of years. Um, I want to I want to uh, switch gears a little bit. Talk about sure. about Israel. Yeah. Um, I, as you know, I love your book, oh, The One Eighty Eighth Crybaby Brigade. Thank you. Um, I read that book, and and I I highly recommend that to everybody who's who's watching. Um, uh, what I love about that book is the 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 brutal honesty. Uh, right, you were you were 26, I think, when you went to Israel. 24 when I went in, but turned 25. In, the 25. So the service, 24. Yeah. This is this is a memoir of of Joel. Joel spent a year in the IDF uh, at 24, and it's it's a memoir of Joel's experience. Uh, also, going in at 24. Most people, when they go into the IDF, they go in at 18. Um, Most are finished when they're 20 and a half or 21. 20 and a half. So that was a big <laughs> right. and so, part of the story is being significantly older than officers, let alone other basic trainees. And and I, and I it also, what, what I liked about it was, is that though there's a lot to admire about the IDF, uh, you know, without the IDF, there wouldn't be in Israel, for sure. For sure. Uh, and um, and it is one of the most um, professional, sophisticated, moral um, armies in the world. Um, but uh, but at the same time, it's an army. <laughs> uh, and uh, we tend to have a romanticized vision of like you know the raid on Antebi and you know and things like that about the IDF. And you you were reflecting on 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 the 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 nitty gritty of, of it. Um, I, I'm wondering. Now, as a parent with with two of your four kids in the IDF, um, how has your perspective changed? Well, it's cliche, but some things change and some stay exactly the same. And in so many, you know, I've been exposed. I also host a television show here called uh, FIDF Live, which is with friends of the IDF. And so I've gotten to go to to military bases and work with the units and interview soldiers that I never would have encountered, even knew existed. And uh, time and again, on the one hand, I am just blown away by how mature these kids are and the responsibility they have and how seriously they take the ethical questions um, about you know having a weapon and what that means to have a weapon and the power to take a life. I mean, they genuinely think about it and genuinely make efforts to minimize minimize casualties and uh it, it 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 blows me away like how much the army pays attention to this at the same time it's a massive organization where the majority of people are 18 and 19 years old and not all of them want to be there and uh and it's it can be sloppy and mistakes can happen and it, it can be disorganized and um and so that, and to that extent, a lot of, you know, that, that element has not changed. You know, a, big, a, a big part of army life is getting out of things, getting out of guard duty, getting out of uh, working in the kitchen. And, and that's, that's still around. I meet a lot of lone soldiers who have read the book and they said, yeah, even though the book is 20 years old, 
these things still happen. As a parent, you know, for me, I think it's been great for my kids. Uh, the two who are in the army now are girls. And I think that changes something when you know they're not in, in combat and not carrying uh, guns. But they, for, for them, it's it's helped them grow. It's given them responsibility way more than I had when that, I was their age, you know, 20 years old. And uh, to that extent, I'm really happy that, that they're doing it. But uh, it, like you said, it's still a big organization and, um, you know, not one of the romanticized things that we grow up with is that they all want to serve. Israelis can't wait to go defend the Jewish people. And a lot of them don't. A lot of them just see it as something they have to do in order to move on to the next stage of their life. And that's something that we have to come to terms with when we when we think about who they are. Um, I, I wonder to what extent the, the circumstances and and um, contemporary history, so to speak, plays into mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, in the, in the early days of the state, certainly, right, where, where Israel was constantly under an existential um, threat of invading armies, you know, maybe people felt differently about coming in. Um, now, um, though there's certainly still an existential threat, I think, from Iran, um, that poses all sorts of questions. Um, the Palestinian, the Palestinian question, even Hezbollah and Hamas, um, are are not existential um, in in their uh, approach. They're they're complex. They're complex uh, military and political problems. Um, but but from you know even when I you know speak to. Uh, national security advisors to the prime minister. It's like they're not existential threats. Um, you know, they're they're obviously you have to defend the citizens from rampant, rap, um, random uh, missile attacks um, and so forth. Um, but I just wonder how much that makes a difference. And you you think you know in comparison right now to what's happening in Ukraine um, and the the what appears to be incredible unity of the Ukrainian people to defend their country because they have an existential threat that they're that they're fighting. Um, I just wonder, you know, how that makes a difference. I mean, Israel, almost 74 years later, um, you know, still has ongoing complex military and diplomatic political problems. Mm -hmm. um, but its existential position is is very different than it was prior to 67. Well, certainly, I mean, it's, it's it's been kind of documented and known that around the first intifada, those were the, that was sort of the first time the system was challenged. Uh, I think you were right. Before then, all the threats really were, you know, existential and keeping Israel on the map. With the first intifada, this uh, you suddenly had 18, 19 year old boys uh, going into uh, Palestinian villages and making house arrests and doing things that weren't necessarily. Uh, going to wipe Israel off the map. And they may have been important, but they also raised a lot of moral questions. And it, it really, um, I think that's when people began to question uh, army service in general. Another big event that you can point to is in February of 1997 with the helicopter disaster when two helicopters crashed over Lebanon. And I think it was 73 soldiers were killed in one afternoon. And uh, that completely changed the uh, the face of the army and in the eyes of the citizens, because until then, uh, you sort of let the army do what it needed to. And suddenly they researched and journalists discovered that the army, the pilots had shut off their lights, which they weren't supposed to do. And it sort of fit in with this other Israeli mentality, which is, of you know, cutting corners and maybe doing things not exactly perfectly, but it gets the job done. And in this case, there were consequences. And I think suddenly parents were a little more hesitant to send their kids um, and, and the age we're living in now is a very different age, too. You know, we're in the I age of the iPhone and the iPad and Instagram where you can document your whole life. And I think that uh, that sort of self-centeredness, not necessarily in a bad way, but the fact that the self and the individual matters so much, it's a little bit of a contradiction uh, against the idea of giving to the country and an idea bigger than you. And, and it presents a tension that wasn't there before. So these, these are all factors that, uh, that, go, that go into it. Uh, we have only a minute left. Uh, tell us about the new book, Essential Tennis. Sure. Well, as you said in the intro, it's not necessarily a Jewish book, although it's full of wisdom. Although a lot of think, Jews uh, play tennis. A lot of Jews <laughs> play tennis. And there is a lot of wisdom that I think is Jewish. But I, I paired up with a tennis coach named Ian Westerman, and he's uh, he runs 
a website called EssentialTennis.com, which is the first one to teach tennis online. And it's been pretty successful. Oh, how, how convenient. There's the cover. And uh, the idea is, is teaching people not just how to play, but how to get better on your own and about the improvement journey. And it comes out on May 31st. And so if you play tennis or know someone who does, it's on Amazon now for pre-order. Thank you for bringing it up. Do, do you play tennis, Joel? I do. And that's how I found him. I, I play a few times a week here in Israel. And when I was looking for inst instruction, I came across Ian and pitched him the idea of writing a book. And uh, that's how the partnership came about. And, uh, and and your contribution to the book is, is, is as a writer? It's as a writer, yeah. I mean, it, it is funny adding... here and there, yeah. but it's mostly taking his words and crafting them the right way so that the, the story can be told and the message gets right. across. All right. So that's two books now that uh, we want people to read. But, but two very people, different books that should, very different books, but for people should not be are, read together. But people yeah. that are that are, you know, interested in Israel and are interested in um, IDF experiences um, with a very funny um, and use of a lot of colorful metaphors. Uh, one eighty eight yeah. crybaby brigade. Bar mitzvah age enough, please. Bar, uh, bar mitzvah age book. enough. For the 188th Cryberry Brigade, it's really it's a it's a. Oh, thank you. Not not only is it entertaining, but but under underneath the humor are some really really important, um, oh, thoughtful uh, okay. reflections. Um, it's a couple of years already, as you said, and still that that book. Um, it's one of the one of the books I've read that that really impacted me in the soul. I appreciate that. Um, Essential tennis. That's probably something I'll give to. Um, uh, to uh, my father's wife, maybe I'll. She's turning 85 um, soon. Maybe I'll. I'll get that for her for her 85th birthday. She's 85 yeah. and she still plays tennis every good day. Good for her. Um, so that that'll be a good gift for her. And uh, and Joel, we really do have to find a way to get you out here in person one of these days sooner rather than later. I'd love to. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us, Joel, and thank you for those that are joining us online. So happy to have pleasure. you here. Uh, for all the things that are happening at Beth Zedek, be sure to visit us online, www.beth-zedek.org, to see any of our video content or to watch our live streams for Shabbat and Chagim. You can go to www.bethzedek, all one word, dot TV. Uh, join us again next week for Conversations Over Coffee. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Have a good week. Shavuot. The heat everyone.